Hey everybody, Lee with LG Speed and Custom here, and in this video we are going to be dropping the axle on Wayne's Model T Roadster pickup. But before we do that, we are doing a revamp on the jig for dropping axles. Gonna go over this and uh, kind of improve it, make it a little bit better. I know a lot of people have messaged me asking, you know, with some details on the dropped axle jig. So this is it, we're gonna do it. We're gonna make this thing new and improved. Although if it's new, how can it be improved? And if it's improved, how can it be new? Nobody knows. Anyway. So first of all, why would you want to drop your axle? Well, let me show you here. This is Wayne's Model T Roadster pickup, and it is on a Model A frame with a stock Model A axle. So you see how straight this is? That is, that's like a zero drop axle. That's what they base all dropped axles off of. So the reason we want to drop this axle is to fix this. You see that big fender gap? This car needs to go down. So essentially, to answer the question, you drop an axle to lower the car. Let's look behind us here at my Roadster and you can see that this is not straight anymore. This kicks way up and when you, by kicking that up, it makes the car come down. So this axle, I believe, is a four inch drop. I actually didn't drop this axle. I bought this axle at a swap meet, I don't know, years and years ago. But the axle in my 32 over here, I did drop. This is also a four inch drop. Although this started out as a like late 32 to 36 axle. So from the factory, it already had a two inch drop in it. We just had to go two inches more. So to drop the axles, this is what we use. This is a dropped axle jig that my good friend Richard Norton built several years ago. And he was downsizing a couple years ago and didn't have space for it. So he called me and said, hey, can I store it at your shop until, you know, whenever. So it's been here a couple years now and I use it quite regularly. But it, it kind of wore out. So yesterday I did a, just a simple rebuild on it. I put, uh, well for starters, let's, let's just talk about how this works. So it's mounted on this huge heavy piece of I-beam here. Off the I-beam we have this upright and on the upright we have a early Ford spindle welded on there. And what that spindle does is holds, you know, the kingpin boss, the kingpin side of the axle in place. It's got a king pin in there right now. It's got the lock pin in there. So this is nice and secure. Then if we go over to this side, we've got another upright going up and it has a series of holes in here. So right now it is set at, this is like zero, ground zero basically. And it sits right in there. If we take this pin out and do, say we wanna do a three inch drop so there's zero, one inch, two inch, three inch. We slide this guy in there. Over on this end, we've got a 20 ton hydraulic jack. So we'll use that to essentially push this up. How are we gonna bend this? Well, you need heat, lots of heat. So that's where this guy comes in. That is just an oxyacetylene torch with a big rosebud tip. And we use that to get this nice and red hot. Then use the 20 ton jack to, you know, essentially stretch this out. So once you start heating it and you start jacking on this, it's going to bend that end up until it hits its three degrees. And then we just keep bending this end. So how do you know when to stop? Well, I've always used a just an angle finder. And I will set an angle finder on here. Like right now, we've got it zeroed out. 
I will set an angle finder on here, zero it out. Then for doing a three inch drop, I'll put my bolt in the three hole and start pushing this up. And as this end comes up, when it gets back to the correct kingpin inclination, like when we're, you know, our camber measurement is right, that will zero out. And that's how we know we're good. That's why I've been doing this for years. However, I've come up with a better way. Let me show you here. So I started, started making this yesterday and I kind of got everything mostly cut out. What I've done is made a little cap to go on the top of there. And now this is going to weld across the top. And that will do two things. One, we have something that we can actually like physically measure from rather than just jacking up into the oblivion and waiting for that angle finder to, to zero out. Now, if we wanna do a three inch drop, we can actually measure from here down and then subtract our three inches and that'll give us a new measurement. From there, I think I've got this plan. I haven't worked it out yet to make sure it's gonna work, but I think we can put little temporary like spacers in here so that we can you know, predetermine where it's gonna end when we hit our three inch. You wanna do a three inch drop, you put you know, spacer three for three inch in there, and then you can just jack this up until you touch that three inch spacer. So that's what we're gonna work on for now. Like I said, I haven't worked it all out yet. I'm kind of just winging this, you know, as I go, but I think it'll work. And when it does work, we'll drop the axle for Wayne's Model T. We're all welded up now. I put a little, couple little pieces in here just to kind of give this some rigidity. And then up front here, I came up with a totally different plan on the spot and went for it because I think it's considerably more simple than putting, like mounting a spacer or something in here. So here's what I've got. Let me, I'll set up a tripod and then I can show you how it works. Okay. So, like I said before, I was gonna put a, you know, some sort of spacer system in here. And then I came up with this idea. So, I got a slot through this plate, and that allows this to drop down. So we wanna do a three inch drop on this guy. We'll bring this down, bottom it out, like so. Pop it out, and what do we got for a measurement there? Like eight and three quarters. So minus three inches would give us five and three quarters. Tighten it up. Slide this guy back in here. And now we just have to push this until the same spot touches that and boom, there's our three inches. So a Model A from 1928 to 31 is all Model A axles, but the perch pin right here is the same from 1928 to 36. Then from 37 to 48, they move the perch pin over here so that the wishbones are a little bit wider and it makes this area a little bit narrower. So for those axles, I made this slot adjustable so we can slide it forward to do those ones. So I think that'll work. Why don't we try it and see? Uh, Wayne wants to do a three inch drop on that so we're all set up to do a three inch. Let's try it out and see how it works. All right, I got the lights off just cause it makes it a little bit easier to see how hot the axle is getting. So we'll fire our torch up. 
Also, one thing I never really showed you guys earlier is I've got this little heat shield here for the for the jack. All right. Now we just warm it up. And by warm it up, I mean get it ridiculously hot. Okay, I think we'll let this cool down for a little bit and then measure our kingpin inclination and see if this works or not. But I don't see why it wouldn't. It should be okay. That looks like a nice drop. So I've got the axle sitting up off the table because you can't get it level because of the, the bow to it. I've got a straight edge going from perch mount to perch mount, and that is level. Now I've got an angle finder on our kingpin perch, and that's to get the kingpin inclination, which is what dictates your camber. So factory Ford specs was around, you know, usually seven to eight degrees. Seven, I think, is uh, what it's supposed to be. But over the years, I mean, these things, they're almost 100 years old, so they're, they're not always exactly on seven degrees. I like them anywhere between like eight to 10 degrees. Ford with their uh, seven degree kingpin inclination would set the, the wheel at one degree positive camber, meaning the top was tipped out a little bit. So I kind of like them tipped in either straight or even tipped in a little bit. It just, it gives you better handling and better cornering and looks a little better in my opinion. So this one here, we've got sitting, bam, right at eight degrees, which means it works. Awesome. That was considerably easier than the way that I used to do it. So we're gonna call this a win. To the other side now. This one checks out, perfect. So we'll let this cool down and then we can paint it black and put it in the car. So if you, in case you haven't noticed, I have not taken the axle out of Wayne's car yet. And the reason being is I have an abundance of cores. So I collect cores and that way when, you know, something like Wayne's car comes in, I can just drop one of these and then take that axle out and kind of switch it all in one go rather than take his roads to pick up a part, take the axle out, drop it, and then put it all back together. But right now, we could hop in this and go for a ride if we wanted to, but we're not. Monday morning, back on the Roadster, Wayne's Roadster pickup. So on Friday, I said we were gonna paint the axle and then put it in, I got a little ahead of myself. We're gonna pull this axle out first and we're gonna mock this spindle up on the new axle because we're probably going to have to heat and bend this steering arm to come down. When the new axle goes in, this is going to be mounted up here now because the axle 
comes up like that. And that is gonna make our drag link not parallel with the wishbones anymore, which will give you bump steer. So we'll heat this up and bend it to kind of follow the contour of the axle and get it as close to this height as we can. And that way the drag link will be parallel again. So Jim's gonna pull this apart right now. We've got uh, some U-bolts under here that will drop the spring out of the cross member. Take these shackles apart. We'll use the porta power to spread the spring so that we can get the, the shackles off. There's a big nut underneath here. Take that nut off and then the perch pin comes off. That separates it from the wishbones. We're just going to unbolt the backing plates and lay them aside. That way we don't have to bleed the system. And then we can take this, put it up on the bench vise, pull the spindles off, mock the spindles up on the new axle, bend that steering arm. I think these steering arms, these are aftermarket bolt-on ones. They'll, I'm pretty sure they'll be fine, but we'll mock it up just to make sure. And then we'll paint it black and install it in the car. We've got the axle out. We just let the spring in because I realized after, you know, the spring doesn't actually have to come out. One issue we've come across is both sides, the inner wheel bearing is stuck on the hub. And I'm not sure why. I'm assuming it's probably because those are like F100 style brakes, which a lot of people do use on early Ford spindles, but you got to use special bearings. And I'm wondering if these are maybe a little bit too small and they got stuck on there. So we'll uh, work at getting those off and then we can take these spindles off and fit them to the new axle. Bearing puller combined with hub puller. Works every time. Spindles off. Check this out. That axle kind of goes a little whoop got a bend in it which you know might think is bad but in reality it doesn't even matter because you can adjust that out with your toe in and toe out on the tie rod and still make your wheels go straight so not a big deal but we're not going to use this axle anyways because we got the drop axle. axles in the vise there's no wow in this one so we can mock up our spindles and we'll probably do the tie rod too because as you drop this like this used to be here. And as it drops, it kind of comes in a little bit. So we're gonna have to narrow the tie rod a little bit as well. Might as well do that here where it's easy to work on rather than under there where you gotta lay on your back and be on your knees. This is why you mock stuff up. We've got our spindle on with our steering arms on. And this guy here just barely rubs in there. So we're gonna shave a little bit off of here so that we can get full steering and then this side here we'll just heat it up bend it down a little bit and then bend it up there we go we're good to go now so we're gonna heat and bend this down now I've uh, test fit this perch pin because we don't want to bend this in a way where it will interfere with this I don't think we will I've also grabbed this has a, a Heim joint style. So I grabbed one that we can use for mock-up because this still needs to be able to fit in there as well. So we can heat and bend it, test fit this, make sure it still works, and then adjust accordingly if it does not. We'll heat it up with the rosebud. And then we got this guy to go in here that we can pull on to bend it down and up.
So we just finished heating these steering arms as well. We had to bend them up just ever so slightly. We mocked it up in the pickup and the tie rod was hitting the wishbone. So I had another set of wishbones upstairs. So we mocked it up on the bench vise with those wishbones and just bent this up just a little bit so that, oops, just so that we got proper clearance in there now. So I think uh, we should be good. We might throw it in the truck one more time just to make sure that this and this are going to clear. The drag link is still in the truck. I think they will be, but we'll do that before we paint it. So we've just set our toe in and toe out by measuring the front and the back of the spindle. And that is where we need to cut the tie rod. So we got to take like what, three, two and a half, three inches off of it. So it was three inches that we had to trim it down. So Jamie is re-threading it now so that we can thread that tie rod back in. So before anybody's all gets on the comments all concerned about the axle getting narrower. We can't see it on this anymore because we don't have the front end under it. But if we look at John's pickup here, when you drop the axle, it will move the tire when it sucks it in like that. It sucks it in more into the crown of the fender. So it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing at all. And on a fenderless car, you know, like my Roadster, for example, you don't even notice. Like it's only an inch and a half on each side. Uh, I don't know if I pointed it out or not. I don't think I did when this did have the front axle under it. The tires were like, you know, they were rated right with the edge of the fender. So by sucking it in a little bit, it's gonna be great. Tie rod's done. So we're gonna take it all apart now and clean and paint everything. Axle's all cleaned up and painted. We just set it in the wishbones with the perch pins, so we'll start assembling things now. All right, the whole front suspension is back in. Everything looks really good. It went together really nice. We changed a couple things. There was grease shields around the hubs that uh, are originally used on like the early Ford brakes. But with these F100 brakes, they were hitting the wheel cylinder and they were so mangled that we, just, we didn't even put them back in because whoever put it together really distorted them a lot. The other thing we changed is the backing plate bolts we, they had just big half inch hex bolts in there. And once again, there was not enough room to properly get a socket in there. So we put uh, socket cap ones in instead, kind of like this. Although you know what, now that I'm standing here looking at this, <laughs> because we didn't put those grease shields back on, just regular hex bolts probably would have worked just fine, wouldn't they have? Oh well. <laughs> yeah, these look nicer, so. Um, those wheel bearings that we had troubles getting off yesterday, when we pulled them off with the hub puller, it distorted the cage a little bit. So we've ordered new wheel bearings and that's what we're waiting for right now. It's like an hour before lunch and we just called the auto parts store and they're like, yeah, we don't know if they're here yet or not. So, so I guess we'll just hang out and wait for them. And that's all that's left to put this front end back together. All right, wheel bearings are done. Wheels are back on. Put it on the ground and see what happens. Well, it's definitely on a rake now.
How's it look? Oh yeah, that's better. You know, I think we could still pull off the reverse eye spring. I think there's enough travel in there. When we measured it uh, earlier, I was a little bit concerned about how much fender clearance we were gonna have. So we didn't reverse the spring, but I think we should get Wayne to come down and take a look at it and see what he wants to do. If we wanna go lower in the front. Also, we were at a swap meet on Sunday and I picked up a model T-spring that'll work in the back of this because the easiest way to lower the back of a car on a Model A frame is if you take a Model A spring out and put a Model T spring in, it lowers it three inches, which would be just about right. But we'll see what Wayne says, because I mean, it doesn't look terrible on a little bit of a hot rod rake either. We should take it for a drive around the block and see if it settles a little bit in the front. See how that tire sucked right in and it's like pretty much in the middle of the fender now. Whereas before they used to be right on the outside edge of the fender. Well, the test drive did not go very well, as you can see by it being apart again. It went well other than one issue. So, you know, we had the, we bent the steering arms up so that the tie rod would go over top of the wishbones. Well, that works great, except this Iron Duke four cylinder that's in this car is sitting really low. And I mean, obviously we built this on the, on the bench vise, so it wasn't actually in the car. And 90% of the time I always run the wish or the tie rod above the wishbone and it's fine. But on this particular one, when Jim and I were both sitting in it and we'd step on the brakes or go over a bump and the front suspension would dip down, the pulley on the front of this engine, the crank pulley was rubbing on the tie rod. So that's no good, no bueno. So I've taken it apart again and I've reconfigured the steering arms to go down instead of up, and that will run the tie rod underneath the wishbones and give us tons of clearance. So I just painted these last night. They're nice and dry now. We'll put them on and hopefully it works this time. <laughs> Hot rods, man, you change one thing and it just like snowballs into a whole bunch of other little things. We've got tons of clearance underneath now, so that worked out good. But in, you know, traditional hot rod fashion, another problem has arrived, and that is these lower shock mounts. So normally these go to the front. I guess actually it would be more like, uh, like that. They kind of mount poking out forward like that. But there's nothing on the front of here to mount the shock. So the original builder of this car 
had them mounted this way on the inside and the shock went up to here. That causes a problem with our tie rod location now because when we hit full lock, let me see if I can turn this here. No, we need, I gotta turn the steering wheel, hold on. So as the steering goes through its motion, those arms make an arc and that moves the tie rod further and closer away from the axle. So when we are at full lock here, the way that these shocks were originally situated, the tie rod runs into the shock mount. Not a huge deal. Like I was saying earlier, it's pretty normal for when you start modifying stuff to have to kind of causes the snowball effect. So I've got the shocks off right now and I'm kind of brainstorming a different idea on how to how to mount the shocks, mount them in a spot where they won't interfere with the suspension or the steering and still articulate properly and do things that shocks are supposed to do. I'll let you know when I figure it out. Shock problem is solved using my LG shock mounts. These are available on my website as well as LG Speed and Custom shirts. Um, yeah, they work really good for universal shock applications such as this. So the original shock used to mount under the frame. I have moved it up. I just got it tacked right now, but I've moved it up to the top of the frame. And then on this end over here, we've got it on the wishbone. So we've got lots of, lots of steering clearance. This side is all welded up so we can touch it up with a little bit of black paint, put our shocks in, and then I think we're, I think we're good to go for round three. All right, the front end is all back together. I think it's gonna work. It works like where it's sitting right now. When you turn it all the way lock to lock, everything seems happy. We've got our shocks reinstalled in there. We've got the uh, reset the wheel alignment. So I think we're ready to take it off jack stands and go for another road test around the block. Hopefully it works this time. Found the shock nut I was looking for. I eventually gave up and went to the bolt bin and grabbed another one. It was right here the whole time. Here we go. First moment of truth. It's a big speed bomb. Oh yeah, that was fine. So far, it's pretty happy. I think we might have won. I just torqued the wheels. They're all happy now. Let's check our camber here. Actually, I already checked the camber. <laughs> I cheated. But yeah, we are zero degrees camber which is okay like i was saying earlier ford originally had it set at positive one meaning the top of the tire was kicked out which uh does make steering a little bit easier but it's not the best for handling so i think at zero we're pretty good i'm even okay with them tipped in a little bit that really helps with uh handling double check the alignment we're good there i think the next thing is we're going to the steering wheel, we gotta reclock it. It's 90 degrees off now. So we'll reclock that, put the hubcaps on, and, and then I think we might go for a bigger road test. Maybe see how it does down the highway. Hubcaps are on, steering wheel set, road test.
All right, well, that was a successful road trip. This one was a little bit of a fighter with that tie rod and the pulley situation and the shock situation, but in the end, it worked out good. And I think it looks great. What do you guys think? We are three inches lower in the front. It's got a nice hot rod rake now. We closed up this gap a little bit. I'm happy with that. Wonder about the back. Do you think, I guess think the back needs to go down or leave it like this? Right now, so this is on a stock Model A frame, and right now it's got just a stock Model A spring in the back. And I've got a Model T spring. If you take the Model A spring out and replace it with a Model T spring, it drops the back three inches. I don't know, does this need to go down three inches in the back? It looks pretty good the way it is. I think it might be okay. I think, uh, I think the only thing I would do if this was my, my own car is I'd probably just put some bias ply tires on it. These are 15 inch rims. I might put some 16s on it with like a 716 in the, in the back and like, you know, a 560, 15 up front. Um, maybe even a 516 up front. I don't know. But it's not my car, it's Wayne's car, and you know Wayne can do whatever he wants. So thanks everybody for watching, I really appreciate it. Uh, if you found this video entertaining, educational, you learned something, you wanna say thanks, like I mentioned earlier, go check out lgspeedcustom.com and get yourself some LG Speed and Custom merch. Get everything from t-shirts to hot rod parts to just, you know, you know, if you only got a couple bucks, we got stickers too, and stickers are great. So thanks to everybody that, uh, supports the website. I really, really appreciate it and supports the channel. So anyways, we'll see you guys on another video. Thanks for watching. Thanks to Wayne for letting me put a dropped axle in his little roadster pickup.